Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to Seattle Atheist Church. So we call ourselves an atheist church because you will never hear anything supernatural promoted from the podium. And um, we, we really, atheists, agnostics, uh, don't have a label for yourself. Whatever you call yourself or don't call yourself, you are welcome here. So at Seattle Atheist Church, um, we uh, do church, we try to do church without cognitive dissonance. That's what it's really all about. And so if you look around you, you know, what is the church about? It's, it's largely about uh, the people who are here in the room. So um, we give the talks. So anything you want to hear a talk on, you can feel free to give it, um, or, uh, but you're not required to give a talk if you want to come and give a talk. That's how uh, the church works. And I want to say thank you to the people who do support financially to make this, this available. Um, and, but there are lots of ways to uh, support, including giving a talk and just coming and being part of it. So everyone is welcome uh, here. Uh, I'm going to share with you our creed, and you can listen to it and see if it, if it makes sense to you. If it does, then you're probably in the right place. So, Seattle Atheist Church was founded on the principles of scientific naturalism and secular ethics. Truth claims are attempted here, and we stand ready to revise our thinking in light of new information. We attempt to be excellent to all conscious beings, and we believe in good because good works in non-mysterious ways. So um, if that sounds useful to you, then you're probably in the right place. And um, oh, so next week we, and the week after, which is Christmas and New Year's Day, we, there will be no church. We're starting up again on January 8th and we'll be in the big room upstairs. So it'll still be easy to find us, but we're just gonna be upstairs and there's a, um, an elevator if anybody should need the elevator to get up there and we uh, when we come back we want to be parking in this parking lot uh, for some reason they are limiting the parking to just the north parking lot so that parking lot but there'll still be free parking uh, today our talk is does evolutionary biology explain everything um, and we have one of our members who is going to come up uh, welcome Steve you want to come up and give a talk? All right. Hey, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, good to see everyone. So the title of today's talk is "Does Evolutionary Psychology Explain Everything?" Yes. Yes, it does. So that's it for the talk. <laughs> I'll, I'll get right, I'll get to the rest. Of it. So, <laughs> all done. Yeah. Um, all right, so let me start by explaining why this is an interesting topic to me. So one of my goals is I want to understand human morality without bringing the divine and the supernatural stuff, right? I want a naturalistic exp explanation for human morality. That's one of the parts of the creed of the atheist church, right? To try to come up with a scientifically naturalistic explanation of things in the world without having to appeal to a divine presence. Um, so there's a tradition here. Um, going all the way back to David Hume, um, Darwin, Adam Smith. Um, there's a tradition of philosophers, biologists, scientists around trying to come up with naturalistic explanations for human behavior. And evolutionary psychology is part of that tradition. And that's why I'm specifically you know, attracted to, I'm, to getting a better understanding um, of evolutionary psychology. Um, so I'm going to focus on two researchers in this area. They're the main sort of proponents for evolutionary psychology over the last 20 years. I'm going to be talking about the research of Lita Cosmides and John Tooby. Um, they've been investigating evolutionary psychology since the 1980s. Um, they have written a huge amount of material. Um, I'm going to be focusing primarily on, at the beginning of the talk, on two papers they wrote. One is uh, called The Theoretical Foundations of Evolutionary Psychology. And I'm also going to take advantage of another paper they wrote called Evolutionary Psychology, a Primer. So most of the material I'll be talking about, unless I say otherwise, is pulled from those two papers. So let me start with a, uh, a brief description of how they define evolutionary psychology. The briefest uh, definition I found is evolutionary psychology is an approach to psychology in which knowledge and principles from evolutionary biology are put to use 
on research on the structure of the human mind. So it's using normal evolutionary biology to try to understand the human mind, extending it out to humans, their mental states and behaviors in the same way as we use evolutionary theory to explain hearts and lungs and livers, or use it to explain mental capacities. Um, so my agenda to today is there's going to be three parts to this talk. The first part is I want to talk about the big ideas behind evolutionary psychology, try to convey you know, sort of my excitement about it, why I think it's an interesting theory. And then we'll talk about a specific application of these ideas. We'll be talking about shame. Uh, they have a paper on shame, and we'll talk about the evolutionary psychology analysis of shame. And then finally, um, I'll bring up some issues with evolutionary psychology um, at the end of the talk. But let's just dive in at the beginning and, and get to the big ideas. So big idea number one, the only explanation that we have for how you can get complexity out of chaos, order out of entropy, is through natural selection. That's the only theory we have. It really is. That, and that was you know, Darwin's big insight, right? That through this mindless brute process of natural selection, as long as you have repli replication, variation, and selection, you have enough to be able to sculpt out complexity out of chaos. That's a big idea because, you know, obviously there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the human mind that's complex. There's a lot of human behavior that's complex. There's a lot of mental states that complex. Um, so since the only real theory we have to explain that type of complexity is natural selection, then that gives some evidence that the right explanation is natural selection. So uh, let me give a quick review of the theory here. Um, a biological feature can be, number one, it can be an adaptation, right? Um, it can be a byproduct of an adaptation, and then finally it can just be noise. It could be random noise, like the flex of colors in your eyes. That's just noise. And so whenever you're looking at a feature, a complex feature of an organism, um, if it's complex, that's an indication that was selected for, and you're going to throw it into either, you know, it is a direct adaptation itself, or it's a byproduct of an existing adaptation. I'll give examples of that. Um, so one example, um, well, let's talk about my favorite animal on earth. My favorite animal on earth is the roundworm. Roundworm is great. We know more about that little roundworm than we know about any other sort of organism on earth. Um, so for the roundworm, there are certain, certain problems that the roundworm has to solve. And these are problems uh, in his environment. So these are called adaptive problems. And you always talk about adaptations in, re in reference to the adaptive environment where the creature is trying to solve a certain set of problems. So for the roundworm, roundworm has to find food or will starve to death and the poor little roundworm will die. We don't want that to happen. But if you remember when we were talking about the roundworm before, one of the interesting things about that little roundworm is it has predators. It has these little fungi that make those little hoops that try to capture it when it's going around through the dirt. And so that's another problem that has in its environment. So those are two adaptive problems that has to solve. And so it has two adaptions for handling that. Um, it uses something called chemotaxis. So what it does is it's automatically attracted to the smell of artificial popcorn. It's great. Roundworms love artificial popcorn. So they'll automatically move in that direction. And it also, um, if you put a hoop around its nose, if you hit the nose in just the right place, it'll reverse motors and it'll start moving backwards. And so it'll escape predators. So those are adaptations because they solve specific problems in its environment that it, it has encountered, right? And these are very specialized <clears throat> circuits within the roundworm for solving those problems. This isn't you know, some general circuit. This is it has one circuit for handling. If it gets tapped on the nose, it reverses and escapes the predator. It has another circuit for always move you know, by default towards something that smells like popcorn. So pretty simple circuits within the roundworm. Um, so Cosmides and Tubi write, finding that a reliably developing feature of the species architecture solves an adaptive problem with reliability, precision, efficiency and economy is prima facie evidence that an adaptation has been located. This is like showing that an oddly shaped piece of metal easily opens the lock on your front door. It is almost certainly a key designed for your door because door locks are not easily opened by random bits of metal, by can openers, by candlesticks, or even by keys designed for other doors. 
So the idea is that, you know, if you find a behavior in the roundworm that's very specialized for escaping, you know, things that would try to put a hoop around it, that's a pretty good indication that that's a direct adaptation for a specific problem in its environment. So let's switch from roundworms, relatively simple organisms, to talking about humans and talk about an adaptation in a human. Um, so Steven Pinker, in his book, The Language Instinct, the whole point of the book was to try to show that humans learn language through a specific adaptation for language acquisition. Um, and he has a number of different arguments for showing that humans pick up language, you know, through this adaptation. Um, one of my favorite arguments has to do with pidgin and creole languages. So the way it works is if you just take a bunch of random humans and you toss them together and they speak different languages, and you throw them into the same location, they'll automatically develop something called a pidgin language. And pidgin language, it's not a full, doesn't have a full grammar. It'll be a cut down language with, you know, simple verbs and whatever. It's just enough for people to communicate. But the fascinating thing about it is if you wait a generation and look at the language that the children speak, they'll speak a Creole language. And the interesting thing about a Creole language is it has a full-blown grammar. So it has a complex grammar, it's a full language in any definition of a language. And this just, you know, sort of arises spontaneously in the next generation. Um, Pinker writes, complex language is universal because children actually reinvent it. Generation after generation, not because they are taught, not because they are generally smart, not because it is useful to them, but because they just can't help it. So it's just something that arises automatically. Um, I remember Pinker used to uh, mock American parents all the time for spending a lot of time trying to teach their children how to walk. He would say, you know, in other countries, they don't do that. They don't try to teach children how to walk because children just learn automatically at a certain age how to walk. But parents, they buy special toys for them. They try to make them walk around. But actually, you know what? None of that has been shown to have any difference at all. It's just at a certain stage, you know, it kicks in. Children are able to walk. And the same idea is for a mental capacity like language. Children just automatically learn language at a certain age. So just to be clear here, in this case, spoken language is the adaptation, right? Um, written and reading and writing language, on the other hand, is a byproduct of language. Because, you know, I can take my children and toss them on a desert island and they would come up with some spontaneous spoken language, but they can be on a desert island as long as you want. They still probably wouldn't come up with written or spoken language. That's a cultural invention where it's a byproduct of an adaptation that we're using for a very specific purpose other than its original, uh, you know, adaptive value. All right, so that's big idea number one. Let me move on to big idea number two. Big idea number two is kind of big. There's no such thing as general intelligence. Um, so let me explain the idea here. Um, Cosmides and Tubi attack what they call the standard social science model. They have an acronym for that, SSM. So the standard social science model, and behind that standard social science model is the idea that there's this magical thing that humans have called reason and learning. And it's a general ability that allows humans to transcend the limitations of their biology and somehow rise above you know, the rest of the natural world. So they can escape naturalism through the power of reason. Um, that's a very powerful vision. And it's actually, according to Cosmodes and Tuvi, at least, it's the reason why social science, sciences and humanities are often divided off from the rest of science. Why uh, trying to understand psychology and sociology, why that's not considered a branch of biology. It's because the idea here is through the power of reason, people have gone beyond what natural selection has shaped them to be able to do. Um, okay, so... Uh, Pinker calls this the blank slate, or the Plato theory of the mind. Um, Cosmody and Tubi write, just as a blank piece of paper plays no causal role in determining the content that is inscribed on it, the blank slate view of the mind rationalizes the belief that the evolved organization of the mind plays little causal role in generating the content of human social and mental life. The mind with its learning capacity absorbs its content and organization almost entirely from external sources. These processes are thought to be analogous to the operation of a video camera. Um, the content of the recording originates in the world, whereas a mechanism of recording adds no content of its own to the mix. So I like that analogy. 
That's the view of the mind. You know what the, how the mind works? It's a video camera. All it does is capture everything that's going on in the external world and stores it. So that gives you an unbounded way to be able to change what goes on in people's minds by just exposing them to you know, different environments, right? It's all sucked in from the external environment. Now, of course, this is very similar. This is part of the empiricist tradition in philosophy, right? John Locke, David Hume, Barclay, all of these people believe that everything that enters the mind has to enter through senses. But that's a crazy theory. Um, let's talk about why that's a crazy theory. Um, Cosmides and Tubi want to argue that human psychology consists of a large number of domain-specific circuits. So circuits evolve to solve very particular problems in their adaptive environment. So instead of there being a general thing called learning and a general thing called reason, which we can employ in any domain at all, um, there are very domain-specific mechanisms built into our heads for handling you know, particular domains of problems that we might encounter, much like the roundworm has a very specific circuit for handling the predator that makes the little hoops to try to capture it. Um, the, and they make an analogy here between a computer and a human mind and talk about the demand for effective word processing and good digital music playback led to different application programs because many of the causal design features that make a program an effective word processing program are different from those that make a program a good digital music player. Indeed, the greater number of functionally specialized programs or subroutines your computer has installed, the more intelligent your computer is and the more things it can accomplish. The same is true for organisms. Um, so the idea here is it would be crazy on your computer just to write one program that does everything. You don't have a general purpose, you know, word processing, image processing, I don't know, email program all combined into a single program because there are better ways to address each of those problems individually. Um, so they're saying, they don't quite say this, but they're saying um, that you know, the human mind is more like an operating system where you have a lot of specialized programs that have been developed to handle specific problems in your environment. They further write, evolutionary psychologists expect a mind packed packed with domain-specific, content-rich programs specializing for solving ancestral problems. Okay, so there's no such thing as general reason. There's no such thing as general learning. Um, let's move on to big idea number three. Big idea number three is the nature-nurture conflict is incoherent. Um, so let's talk about that. Most people think of the nature-nurture conflict as a zero-sum game between nature on the one hand and nurture on the other. So if you ask a question, you know, is eye color, is that genetic or environmental? People will try to come up with, well, it's this percent environmental, this percent um, genetic. Cosmides and Tubi write, any developmental biologist knows that this is a meaningless question. Every aspect of an organism's phenotype is the joint product of its genes and its environment. To ask which is more important is like asking, which is more important in determining the area of a rectangle, the length or the width? Which is more important in causing a car to run, the engine or the gasoline? Genes allow the environment to influence the development of phenotypes. In particular, learning cannot happen without the brain having a certain structure. Three pounds of oatmeal don't learn, but three pounds of brains do. So the idea here, this is related again back to the Plato theory of the mind, you know, the blank slate theory. Look, you really can't learn anything unless there's some program there to learn it. As any, I mean, you know, computer programmer knows, you have to start somewhere with a program to start interpreting all the stuff coming in from the environment. Um, the real disagreement between people like, you know, B.F. Skinner and Chomsky and Pinker are whether or not there's a general learning ability or whether there's specialized learning for different domains of knowledge. It's not over whether or not, you know, there's some genetic or, you know, some sort of structural component to learning already there in the brain. Um, and this is, so you'll remember that B.F. Skinner uh, came out with a book uh, called Verbal Behavior that Noam Chomsky at the very beginning of his career criticized for that very reason. BF, in Verbal Behavior, B.F. Skinner was trying to show that the same general learning mechanisms that you can learn to use to learn everything else could be, learned, could be used to learn how to speak. And Chomsky was very critical of that. And he wanted to show, no, no, there's a very specific mechanism in the brain for learning for language acquisition that's different from a general learning capacity. Um, all right, 
Finally, big idea number four, we evolved for a specific environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, the EEA. So environment of evolutionary adaptiveness. Now let me, let me explain the idea here. So evolutionary psychology has some overlap with sociobiology. And if that's the E.O. Wilson stuff from like 1975, created a big stir at the time. Um, the overlap has to do with trying to ex explain human behavior um, through, um, through natural selection. You remember E.O. Wilson got into so much trouble because he wrote this massive book. E.O. Wilson is a, was originally an entomologist, so lots of chapters on ants, lots of chapters on other animals. He was flying all the way through the book until he got to the last chapter where he applied natural selection to humans, and then that created all sorts of problems. Um, people didn't like thinking that human behavior could also be explained through natural selection. The difference, though, between evolutionary psychology and sociobiology is sociobiologists, not all, but some sociobiologists try to explain every human action in terms of how it results in greater fitness, in, in terms of how it results in greater uh, differential reproductive success. So if you have to decide whether to go to the store or go, I don't know, to a movie, then, you know, if you're being a strict sociobiologist, you say, well, that, that decision that some way or another has to be based on trying to calculate out, you know, what would, what would result in the greatest number of uh, differential um, success in the next generation in terms of the number of offsprings that share your genes. In contrast, evolutionary psychologists argued that adaptions, adaptations were selected for a specific environment of evolutionary adaptiveness, the EA. Um, you have to remember, for the vast majority of human existence, we did not have heaters. We weren't sitting in nice buildings with lights. We didn't have little cameras around us. We didn't have chairs. We were off roaming the savanna in small tribes of 50 to 150 people where everyone you were going to know in your life you've already met. You, you're, they're going to spend the same time with the same people and you have a, a nomadic existence and you have a very, very, you know, limited life in terms of what you can do. No heaters, no, you know, no internet, no nothing. And almost all the adaptations that we have developed within this context, right? It didn't develop within the context of modern civilization. It developed in the context of all those years off in the savannah, you know, running away from, I don't know, bears and tigers and, you know, apparently swooping birds from the sky trying to eat us. That's, that's the environment where we were trying, that we were trying to survive in. Um, so for this reason, current behavior might not be adaptive at all. Um, for example, my favorite example, um, donuts, right? Donuts are not adaptive. You don't find many donuts off in the savannah. There's not wild donuts out there they can find. There's a very limited amount of sugar and fat. And so traditionally, if you're off wandering around, you'd gobble that stuff up as quickly as possible. Now, there's no shortage of donuts. I could go over, spend $100 over that Safeway over there and get you know boxes and boxes of donuts and just go wild on the donuts. It would not be good for me though. I would die very quickly. And that explains why there's so much diabetes and obesity and all that, because our built-in adaptations don't fit our current environment, but that shouldn't be surprising, right? They developed you know, for our ancestors. Um, another example that Tubi and Cosmides use is computer programming. Um, suppose, for example, that a computer programmer were to become wealthy through writing code and use that wealth to conceive many children. I'm not sure if that actually works, but anyway. Um, <laughs> this, this would not make computer programming, which is a very recent cultural invention, an adaptation, nor would it mean that the cognitive mechanisms that enable computer programming are adaptations designed for producing computer programs. The ability to write code is a beneficial side effect of cognitive adaptions that arose to solve entirely different problems, ones that promoted reproduction in an ancestral past, these adaptations might include numerical ability that underwrite foraging, recursion for producing meta-representations, grammatical mechanisms, certain deductive capacities, and so on. So the point here is just because you see a behavior 
that results in greater reproductive success doesn't necessarily mean that it's an adaptation, right? This could be a byproduct of a bunch of other adaptations that come from the past. In the case of computer program, almost certainly our ability to program computers is you know, a byproduct of our ability to use language and use logic and use a bunch of other skills than the case of computer programming get combined together to be able to use for a purpose that they weren't originally selected for. All right, so those are the big ideas. Those are the four big ideas from um, evolutionary psychology. I wanted to talk about one application of these ideas. So Cosmides and Tubi, um, they contributed to a paper that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on shame. And you know, since I'm interested in morality, I'm gonna focus on the shame stuff because that has some connection with morality. And what they, what they argue, this was a study, and what they argue in this study is that shame is an adaptation that evolved as a defense against devaluation from others. Now let me explain the context here. A lot of psychologists have argued that shame is always bad. Shame is maladaptive. You should do everything you can to get rid of shame. It's just something people don't want in their lives. And what they want to argue instead is, no, um, shame is a complex behavior. And the right way to understand shame is it's an adaptation that's used to solve a certain a problem in the environment. And the problem in their environment that they're identifying is that if you live in a ancestral culture, then you're going to be living with a small group of people, 50 to 150 people again, and you're going, your life is going to be dependent on those other people's lives, right? Because if Sally over there kills a tiger and you upset Sally and she doesn't share the tiger meat with you, you're going to be dead in a few days. So it's important to get along with your tribe mates or you're not going to last very long. And so what their theory of shame is, is shame is a way, is a communication mechanism for social disvalue. And the way that they tested this is they, created, they got a set of participants and they divided them into two groups. They had the audience participants and the shame participants. And what they did is they asked the uh, members of the audience participants to use a scale of one to seven to rate how negatively they would rate people in 29 scenarios. Let me give you some examples of the scenarios. He does a bad job taking care of his children. He is not generous with others. He has no idea how to load or fire a gun. He has poor table manners. So these were example scenarios and people were supposed to say, well, how negatively would they rate someone if this was true of someone? And then they took a separate group, the shame group, and they asked them to, for the same scenarios to rate how much shame they would feel if these were true of them. And anyway, so they had the two groups, they didn't communicate at all. Um, and what they showed was that, you know, there's a very high correlation between how people negatively rated different scenarios and the amount of shame people felt, right? Um, so they not only showed that in the United States, they picked scenarios that are cross-cultural. So they also did these experiments in India and Israel to show that these, um, that there's a high correlation between people having negative feelings about these different scenarios and the feelings of shame. And then for the sake of comparison,